MRCS from College of England, Edinburgh, Glasgow, and Dublin. He has done his MD academic surgery from the university, FRCS from Intercollegiate Board UK, and FEBS from European Board of Examinations. So prior to joining Apollo, he served as consultant, uh, consultant gen, uh, general and colorectal surgeon at Princess Alexandra Hospital in Essex, UK. He holds the position of honorary senior lecturer in Queen Mary University of London. His areas of interest include col cancer surgery, colonic, rectal, anal, appendiceal, pelvic and peritoneal. His work also includes proctology, inflammatory bowel disease, diverticulosis, and all aspects of functional and pelvic floor problems. He is a laparoscopic and robotic surgeon. On the research front, his interests are on precision oncosurgery, uh, psycho-oncology, decision-making, <coughs> and health outcomes in surgery. He has published and lectured nationally and internationally, has been an invited speaker on a speaker on number of subjects, he is a key, key, key opinion leader in precision colonic oncosurgery and a reviewer of number of journals. Dr. Narsimaya is authority in his field as colonary physician with the vast experience in colorectal and surgical onco oncological surgery. Administratively, clinically, and scientifically, he is keen to contribute to development of our uh, colorectal program at Apollo Group. So he is with us. Uh, primarily, the discussion. Uh, uh, when I was talking to him about, uh, you know, the interest we also have in gut microbiome uh, and uh, the implications of that in mental health, gut microbiome dysbiosis uh, and the connections to neuroinflammation and then uh, in the pathophysiology of uh, psychiatric and neurological disorders and that being marker, uh, the potential of that being uh, marker in uh, assessing treatment outcomes, especially that of Ayurveda and yoga. So this uh, actually uh, stirred the interest in him also to look at, uh, you know, that microbiome and uh, the researches. Dr. Narasimaya, we would be keen to know uh, the uh, role implications and as a tool, how much of uh, this we can utilize in the uh, in understanding the mechanisms of uh, you know neuropsychiatry and mental health so we welcome you to department of uh, integrative medicine uh, i also welcome dr shivranji and uh, he is our head of the department uh, you just uh, talk to him so we will be very uh, we are very, very glad to have you here and uh, yeah uh, over to you she uh, nurse First of all, uh, I'm very grateful and I'm very humbled uh, for having me uh, brought into this uh, elegant, enlightened crowd uh, to actually uh, share my thoughts and also learn. You know, I think the first disclosure I would like to put it across is I'm no expert in this. <laughs> I'm learning as uh, the days have gone by and we are still trying to do that. So I hope, you know, I can uh, inform you of a bit of what I know and also learn uh, a bit of what you know so that it can make sense to what we do for the greater good of the society. Uh, we all believe in the Vasudhaiva Kutumbam and I think uh, there's no one way uh, to reach that or to gain that. Uh, I think it's a number of ways and center of integrative medicine is certainly the uh, right uh, forward way, I think. Um, to start with, I do not have any disclosures to talk about, and this is pure out of my interest I'm doing it. Uh, I'm a colorectal surgeon and a lot of my work goes to uh, the gut, not only the organic problems related to the gut, but also a lot of the functional aspects related to the gut. Uh, we certainly believe in the uh, the gut brain access to a great extent uh, and from and that's the reason I'm here. Uh, I think it's important for us to explore a bit more about the terminology we are talking about about the gut microbiome, the microbiota, the fecal transplant uh, sort of thing. So maybe I'll touch a bit on that and I'm going to just put across my understanding of what we are really looking at. A lot of it uh, is uh, my personal opinion. Added on to that is some amount of evidence that has come from studies. Uh, I think what is very topical and interesting is the fecal transplants, uh, which is 
used reasonably uh, so to say in our speciality uh, and uh, i'm also aware that it is also used in a quite a few um, you know uh, illnesses related to the mind so to say uh, and how the translation of pathophysiology can happen uh, from one organ to the other organ uh, stays the same uh, i think you know if you go back historically it is not something new that we have talked about that all the problems related to the body mind and the soul starts from the gut uh, Hippocrates said it no wrongly. He said all disease begins in the gut, and the root for all happiness also stays in the gut. This takes me back to the British days where you're waiting for the long week to finish to get to an Indian restaurant for a nice curry to keep the gut happy, so to say. So I think the health per se is determined by microbiota in our gut, said Hippocrates. Not now. This is going back a long, long, long time ago. So if you look at the human body, I think it always surprises us, you know, that there is so much hidden within the human body, just not about the, the human cells, but the interactions that occur between the various organisms, various living ecosystem members, which actually lead on to a better well-being. In fact, if you look at it, Whitman said it in 1998, there are at least 100 trillion microbial cells. And sometimes it is difficult for us to even put the number of zeros following a trillion. I think we all live in a system of symbiosis. We help them, they help us. I think the genes they encode is what becomes a microbiome. And there is extensive colonization of our body, especially on the surfaces of the body. Skin, example, mucosa. I mean, the gut is a huge organ. I mean, two to two and a half meters of large bowel, about three to five meters of small bowel, you know, makes place for a lot of microbiota, a lot of microbes to reside in them. And we have a great affinity, affiliation to talk about and to deal with these microbes. I mean, these are just not bacteria. They can be viruses, they can be fungi, they can be eukaryotes. They can be a number of different living beings as such. When we say the most vital organ is the heart in the body, or we say it's the brain, but in fact, probably the one which is most important is the gut, and I think it is the forgotten organ. We all talk about a concept called as psychoneuroimmunology. I think if one can take away three words from what I know, it is about psychoneuroimmunology. A robust psychology, which is driven by number of neurohormonal transmitters. It could be serotonin, it could be you know, dopamine, it could be number of neurostimulatory hormones they are impacted by a number of factors. Even just the psychological aspect of thinking positively, positive thinking, mindfulness, Kundaini Yoga, a number of things that can keep you calm, keep you happy, keep your psychology at a better state can actually trigger your hypothalamus to trigger better response in your immune system, leading on to neurohormonal changes, driving changes in the system we see. And this aspect of psychoneuroimmunology is the most vital thing in all the ailments we see today. I always say something to people when I talk about them because I'm very passionate about the mother nature. And I say, you know, the cause and cure for all illnesses lies in the mother nature. The second thing I say to people is about how we have become, the newer generation of people have become a cultural misfit to our own society. We've forgotten our traditions, we have forgotten our traditional cooking, we've forgotten what we used to eat normally, a balanced diet, sitting on the floor with a routine habit. And not only just about eating, even the toileting habits, evacuation is as important as ingestion. The use of Western toilets, the pressure of life, 
career driven society all these things have actually made us what i call as a cultural misfit and a civilizational poverty state all these are driving not only gut problems but problems related to the mind as well so bringing you back to the psycho neuroimmunological aspect things that can impact either positively or negatively on this psycho neuroimmunological axis can either give us good outcomes or can cause trouble when we talk about positive thinking mindfulness these are all positive reinforcing factors which are giving us good outcomes but let us look at negatively impacting factors and one of the factors that can negatively impact is probably the gut dysbiosis we are all living in in harmony you know the gut as we said harbors you know innumerable microbes and we are all in a state of balance helping each other maintaining the milieu of the system this can get disrupted easily it could be the change in the food we are eating the fast food the processed food utilization of antibiotics extensively which actually leads to disruption of this bacterial milieu use of antibiotics extensively is been a big problem for us and we are still struggling with it use of fertilizers in the food we use post world war i think we are just consuming food which is contaminated with fertilizers contaminated food water which is not clean air which is polluted so all these things are the negative drivers that are driving the gut balance into a state of disarray when this happens we see a lot of disease processes which cause significant problem to us what has been less explored is what is the relationship of this gut dysbiosis to the mental health i would like to spend less of a time on how the microbiota is involved in you know essential functioning such as energy harvesting storage and metabolic functions but what i would like to stress on is about how it interacts with the host immune system and how this can be translated into either better outcomes or poor outcomes at this juncture i would like to give you a small example before we go into the nitty gritty of the whole process there was a study that was conducted probably about 10 or 11 years ago which was published as well the study came from memorial sloan catering hospital and um, hcg hospital in bangalore where they picked up groups of patients which were who were stage matched for breast cancers and they looked at the social factors ie family support support system in india and things like positive thinking yoga mindfulness sort of thing which was routinely and regularly implemented in our group of patients and in the western society they just let them do as is whatever the standard of practice was the interventional arm being the indian arm so it was a reasonably well designed study so they, they looked at quality of life measures they looked at pre intervention markers such as you know uh, interleukin 1 6 8 tnf alpha and they also looked at longevity survival and the quality of life so once the study finished what was surprising was people in the indian arm lived a bit longer their happiness quotient was much better their quality of life was much better and even the pro inflammatory cytokine levels were much lesser in the indian group compared to the western group so this is a simple example of the psycho neuro immunological aspects of what can be done you know if there is a positive trigger a stimulus to the right system at the right time we spend lakhs of rupees on immunotherapy today training the thymic car t cells to go and attack cancer cells we spend a lot of money the same thing could be done if we are doing it in the right way utilizing our traditional systems like yoga ayurveda etc now bringing you back to a bit of bacteria or microbiota i mean this slide essentially gives you an idea about how this environment is constantly changing it is like seasons in a year 
you know you have different types of plants much more than you see say summers are a bit more sp sparse winters and you know uh, spring is much more green and there's always a change in the flora and the fauna we see if you want me to put it into a simple way similarly the gut microbiome the gut microbiota you know the organisms in the gut actually change during various times of your life and as you see in the adulthood it actually you know picks up a lot of them which we will be interested in and you see that you know there is raised interleukin 4 you know with proteobacteria there is raised bacterioids and firmicutes you know which says there will be increased tumor necrosis alpha and interleukin 1 beta because a lot of them are put forward in the pathogenesis of various problems both organic non-communicable diseases such as cancers as well as uh, mental health illnesses. So the interaction that happens between this gut microbiome is complex, least to say. They'll take you back to all the inflammatory cytokines. And as Kishore briefly mentioned, it is all triggered through the pathway of inflammation the gut dysbiosis, how it can lead on to changes in your immune system, which can lead on to inflammation in various organs, so to say. I think the mind, the mental health, again involves tissues, neurotransmitters, hormones, and it is an inflammatory process it is going through, like we see inflammatory process happening in the colonic lining, happening in the joints, happening in the sclera. No, this is what typically happens in what we think is the inflammatory bowel disease, the Crohn's, the ulcerative colitis. The same sort of process is going on in the neuronal system, thereby leading to inflammation in the nervous system, leading to problems related to the mind, so to say. So in simplistic terms, this is the microbiome gut brain axis. The gut microbiota can influence the way the brain can act and the way a person can behave. Activation of mucosal immune responses. I think the mucosa is one place where the number of interactions are innumerable and we underestimate the importance of the mucosal immune responses. The metabolites that are produced within the gut, how they impact on the integrity of the gut and how they influence on the immune interactions in the gut is also very vital. And these metabolites might be in turn dependent upon our food habits, in turn dependent upon the probiotics that we are on, in turn dependent upon the types of probiotics that are already there, the type of antibiotics we have been on, the amount of food we consume, the type of food we consume, the medications we take, the mindset we are in. I think all of these have got a role to play, I think. The local gut barriers such as mucin, that is like a protection. And when this protection is gone, for whatever reason, the biomes which are there, the bacteria which are there, even they are lost in the process, whether it is because of extensive diarrhea, extensive viral infections, extensive bacterial infections, you know, all these can have an impact on the gut, so to say. Similarly, if this triggers an inflammation within the immune system, the local regional immune system, and it becomes a part of the systemic inflammatory pathway, triggering the various inflammatory systems. It could be the coagulation system. It could be the you know thrombolytic system. It could be the you know coagulation cascade system. It could be the complementary system. Any of the above systems can lead on to inflammation. And I think once an inflammation kicks in, the respective functions of the organ will be disrupted leading on to what we see in terms of the gut. It could be diarrhea, it could be bloody diarrhea, it could be constipation, it could be bloating. Similarly, if you translate that to the mind or the mental health, 
it could be about autism it could be about anxiety it could be about depression it could be about schizophrenia it could be about... so all these things you know can be easily understood all related to these gut microbiome so to say so i think dysbiosis is a, a common theme we see when it comes to disease processes and it is not a one to one linear correlation with factor it is related to a number of factors and it is truly multifactorial when it comes to the microbiomes it is a number of you know bacteria viruses literally anything you think about let me give you an example i am an old timer i am about 46 48 years old in fact i am 46 years old we used to have a religious ritual going back to about 25 30 years ago our grandmothers you know, used to get all the cousins together and there used to be a two day, I wouldn't say a festival, it was actually torture, you know, where we were all dewormed. Castrol with some herbs and medications and two days you're just dewormed. You know, you're just going to the toilet every two hours and you know, then you're rested and whatever. So the whole process of deworming used to happen. And this was a ritual every summer holidays for us. What has this got to do with the worms? What has this got to do with the helminths we are talking about? I think part of the protection that we were offered by these hookworms, roundworms, spinworms, stercoloids was all modifying the immune response, modifying the immune system in our body. And today we know that presence of these parasites are protective to a lot of autoimmune diseases, such as Crohn's, colitis, you know, number of even irritable bowel syndromes, we say are protected for people who have been exposed to these parasites. So much so people are transplanting, you know, these organisms into the guts and the, the, and the whole focus of fecal transplant is not anything new anymore. So likewise, it is multifactorial depending upon the organisms, the bugs, how one's lifestyle is in terms of the food, the diet, the probiotics, you know, the illnesses one is going through, the genetic factors that add on to the whole process, the stress we are in, so on and so forth. So I think what is important is not to forget that it is a multifactorial process and it is all a matter of marginal gains. If you have to improve it, we have to act on different you know, aspects of this multifactorial system. We work on a basis called as marginal gains. Let me take an example of, uh, say, an eating disorder, anorexia nervosa. We know that it is a disease related to the mind to a great extent. There is not much of evidence to say medications help, but we do utilize medications so as to ride over the crisis that might loom in. But if you think about it, what has led to this anorexia nervosa to start with? People talk about the cultural influences. People talk about a genetic predisposition. People talk about predilection to obsessive compulsive disorders. People talk about adolescence, people talk about hormones, people talk about the type of food they consume. And needless to say, even the gut microbiome has a role to play. So this is surely a multi-factorial multi process we are seeing, but a major weight can be put on the dysbiosis that happens within the gut leading on to these problems. If I keep talking, I think most of the common problems we see can be put to some amount of link to the gut, so to say. Think about what we are going through now, the whole phase of Corona. People say these are prebiotics, these are probiotics, this food is good for you, these have got antioxidant, etc. And we consume them. Look at them, helminths confer resistance to autoimmune diseases, which is what I was trying to highlight just a couple of minutes ago. And look at this, you know, we always talk about gastritis in people. We talk about ulcers in the stomach. And again, there's a bug called as H. pylori 
presence of it in a greater extent can lead on to these sort of problems. Even cancers have been shown to be related to presence of a particular bacteria or a particular species of bacteria, so to say. So this is what I was trying to flag into. Look at celiac disease. So in celiac disease, where there's a major absorptive problem within the gut, you have the bacteroids, which are high, the E. coli, which is low. Look at that, you know, E. coli, Escherichia coli is an organism which is present in the human gut. It is present in the whole of the gut, predominantly the lower gut. Less of E. coli can lead to celiac disease, which is very debilitating cannot eat a lot, abdominal pain, weight loss, sort of things. And also look at this H. pylori in the gastric cancer group. You know, so more of H. pylori exposed to gastric cancers. So likewise, let us take me to, let us take you all to autism. If there is raised bacteriodates in the system, there's an increased bacterial diversity of autistic children compared to controls. So I think it is truly something to look into that, you know, the dysbiosis has got a significant impact, not only on the body, but on the mind and the soul and the functioning of the body. I mean, here we go, anorexia nervosa, you know, so this is Mythinobrevibacter smithy, you know, so a raised presence of this can actually lead to patients suffering anorexia nervosa. Look at the IBD, lots of work. And these are all reasonably evidence-based, published in good journals with a good, you know, uh, recommendation, so to say. So let me give you a small example. So uh, before I pitch into what the future directions are, I had a patient not long ago, it was about three and a half, four years ago, with what we call as C. diff colitis. This patient has been exposed to a lot of antibiotics and he landed up with Clostridium difficile colitis. Patient was just about, I think he was about 22 or 23, a Caucasian guy from outer, outer part of London, toxic with multiple organ failure. The colon was distended and he had Clostridium difficile, toxic megacolon. The recommendation was to take the colon out, but he was too unwell even to get to the operating theater. So we've been hearing about you know, fecal transplant. So we ordered some you know, uh, fractioned, you know, curated fecal transplant, fecal material from King's College Hospital because he was not fit for an operation. Otherwise he would have landed up with an operation. So we gave him three or four doses of this and surprise, surprise, one week down the line, was actually you know, extubated. Two weeks down the line, he shifted to the ward. His toxic megacolon had resolved and uh, he's still living happy uh, three, four years down the line. So what did that fecal transplant change what none of our medications could do? I think it is the microenvironment that it changes. It is the small changes that happen in the microenvironment of the gut which leads on to local neuro hormonal changes, local immunological changes, which actually sends the right messages to the right places so that the immune system picks up to dampen the inflammatory response that the body is going through because of what is happening in the gut secondary to dysbiosis. I think this is the way you know, things have moved on now and we pay a lot of emphasis in terms of protecting the gut biome, protecting the gut environment. So much so, you know, the more cleaner we are, the less healthier will we be in the long run. The less cleaner you are, not that we have to be dirty, but I think we have to just go with the mother nature. I mean, those who have grown up in Bangalore, we can tell, I could drink tap water from anywhere. I could drink, you know, even a water from a pond 25 years ago. Today, we don't drink tap water at all. We all utilize bottled waters, sterilized waters. So I think the system has become too clean and it has failed to evoke, generate a response in the immune system, which can actually protect us in the longer run. I think that is what we are trying to see. So the future directions, 
certainly will be to you know look into the gut microbiota i think we have to just get back to our mother nature our culture our cultural practices you know the homemade yogurt which has got an old seedling in it ಕನ್ನಡದಲ್ಲಿ ಹೇಳ್ತೇವೆ ಮನೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಮಾಡಿರ್ತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಮೊಸರು ಹಳೆ ಹುಳಿಯಿಂದ ಬಂದಿರ್ತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಮೊಸರು ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಗಾಟ್ ಅ ಲಾಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಲ್ಯಾಕ್ಟೋ ಬಿಸಿಲಾಯ್ ಕಂಪೇರ್ ಟು ಯುವರ್ ರೆಡಿ ಟು ಬೈ ಆನ್ ದ ಶೆಲ್ಫ್ ಲ್ಯಾಕ್ಟೋ ಬಿಸಿಲಾಯ್ ಸೋ ಟು ಸೇ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಗೆಟಿಂಗ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಟು ದೋಸ್ ಟ್ರೆಡಿಷನಲ್ ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟಿಸಸ್ ವಿ ಡೋಂಟ್ ನೋ ಹೌ ಮಚ್ ಆಫ್ ಬೆನಿಫಿಟ್ಸ್ ದ ಪಿಕಲ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಗಾಟ್ ಯು ನೋ ಆಲ್ ದೀಸ್ ದ ಕಲ್ಚರಲ್ ಹ್ಯಾಬಿಟ್ಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ಯು ಹವ್ ಫೊಗಾಟನ್ ಗೆಟಿಂಗ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಟು ಅವರ್ ಕಲ್ಚರಲ್ ನಾಟ್ಸ್ ಈವನ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಯು ನೋ ಹ್ಯಾವಿಂಗ್ ಎ ಕುಕ್ಡ್ ಮೀಲ್ ಎ ಫ್ಯಾಮಿಲಿ ಮೀಲ್ ಟುಗೆದರ್ when it comes to anorexia we have talked about family therapy being a very vital aspect of the cure why is that i think it is that family therapy the joining together the coming together that helps the hypothalamus to drive that helps the body to generate those neuro hormones which is necessary to feel good to get better to get rid of the irrational thoughts and so on and so forth so i think we need to get back to our cultural norms or at least what we think is a cultural misfit we should try and fit back to our old traditional cultures utilize the available system of practices whether it's ayurveda yunani allopathy so everything is complementary to each other and i think that is where the integrative system of medicine will come into play and also let us not be too much shocked about the civilization because i say civilizational poverty is what we are in the western toilets big disaster the microwaves a big disaster food cooked cooled stored re microwaved they have got bacteria which can lead to cancer sitting and eating leads on to central obesity doesn't trigger your pancreas to produce those secretions that are necessary the western toilets absolute disaster for pelvic floor dysfunction and the reason why we are seeing so much of cancers left sided is not only because of other environmental factors but toileting is a very important factor you have contaminated toxic waste products sitting in the rectum and the left side of the bowel for hours together thereby irritating the bowel wall the rectal wall leading to cancers so i think we are in a state of civilizational poverty which we have to rectify and the richness i say to people these days is is not the money is not the wealth you know the new richness is being poor you know a poor person you know it's anything you give him he doesn't say it has got sugar this is diabetic this is fatty this is cholesterol no he eats anything he wants he doesn't need to struggle for sleep he doesn't go on you know uh, uh, sleeping tablets every night he just wants a place even a hard rock surface he gets to sleep and he doesn't have to think about money black money accounts auditors and he earns for today he lives for today i think the new richness is being poor i think so i think in summary i think this is what we have to do we have to get back to our roots we have to stop westernizing ourselves adapt what we have around us and let us all live in harmony and uh, we are actually thinking about transplanting feces to people and we do that i do that as a part of what i do for all inflammatory bowel diseases for all you know uh, gut related problems where organically i can't do anything but at the same time functionally they are very impaired their quality of life is worse and we do do a lot of uh, fecal transplants so to say uh, i hope uh, i have driven some amount of knowledge i have uh, and i'll be truly happy to take any questions uh, i'm not an academic working on uh, fecal transplants but i have tried to share what i know uh, with you enlightened educated crowd i'm very grateful for the opportunity and i'm happy to take any questions thank you thank you uh, dr shinu uh, narsimhaiya uh, may i now uh, uh, hand over the uh, session to shivram sir to moderate the questions uh, and also to uh, give a vote of thanks thank you dr nasimaya i think it's a very interesting uh, lecture uh, you seem to be a combination of a psychiatrist and a <laughs> colorectal uh, surgeon uh, but it this of course fits in with the, uh, for example in we have a we run a metabolic clinic uh, for patients with psychiatric disorders uh, because many of our antipsychotics and other things lead to metabolic problems uh, and therefore we have a you know, 
section of uh, diet and yoga. Uh, but uh, our, many times our residents neglect asking what actually they are doing already. For example, they may be eating ragi and our people will uh, tell them something else. You know, you should eat, take olive oil and they should take, I mean, the patients who come to us, first of all, I mean, most of them cannot even afford olive oil, forget it. Uh, but it is somehow seen as uh, better than what practices we are already following. Uh, like you say, it seems that the urban people need to actually go back and learn what the rural <coughs> people are doing rather than the reverse uh, happening. Uh, unfortunately, that is the, and that is the trend we notice now uh, that people from urban areas are coming and asking for the Ayurveda yoga. Whereas in the rural areas, people are going towards quick, quick fixes like steroids and uh, other things, which you know is a paradoxical thing, but it is possibly because this knowledge, what you are talking about today, is not percolating to the rural area. Uh, they look at the cities and they think that this is the way to live, and we look at America and we think this is the way to live. Uh, but uh, one of the, uh, I don't know whether you have been to Taiwan. <coughs> Taiwan is one of the countries which has managed to modernize many of the systems without losing their uh, sort of culture or living practices. Uh, they have modernized many of the equipment, the roads, other things, but they have not changed their living style, uh, their joint family system. Uh, there is not a single uh, KFC or McDonald's in Taiwan, which is very surprising, but then somehow they managed to do it. I think India has uh, sort of gone too far in the wrong direction. So thank you for um, giving your thoughts on that. Uh, I wanted to ask you particularly regarding uh, this prevalence of IBS. Uh, is it something that it is truly going up in India or more people are aware or bothered about it? Uh, I, nowadays, I see so many people complaining of IBS, which was not the case a few years back. Okay. No, I think a, a excellent few points to uh, uh, take up from your thoughts, uh, Sarji. So let me take you back to the metabolic clinic you mentioned. Uh, you know, uh, man's biggest enemy today is overnutrition. Ati adalli amrutavu vishavaguttade. In excess, even nectar becomes poison. There's an old Egyptian proverb that goes, a fourth or a quarter of what we eat is for us. Three quarters is for my doctor. So it's so much true when you spoke about the metabolic syndrome. You said we have metabolic clinics. And you know the biggest risk factor for all cancers today is obesity. There is no one cancer that is not related to obesity. And if you look at the pathophysiology of how these cancers occur is because of the adipose tissue. Adipose tissue is estrogenic. Estrogen and adipose tissue drive inflammation in the system. Inflammation in turn triggers changes leading on to cancer. So that is the first thing when you said metabolic clinic. I think what we have to inform people is So this body is a divine temple. Here, the bank balance for a day should be zero. You start with 1800 calories, you end with zero calories at the end of the day. Just eat how much you need, burn the rest. But what has happened is we eat in excess, we spend less, and we keep doing that on a sedentary lifestyle basis. The drugs we use add misery to that, steroids add misery to that, stress adds misery to that, and 
all of these are adding on to the metabolic problems. And we know even metabolic problems such as obesity drives mental illness and vice versa. So I think that is one thing which we cannot forget. And I think when we are dealing either with mental illnesses or organic problems of obesity, we cannot forget the other aspect. When you're seeing an obese patient, check their mental status. When you're seeing a, a mentally unwell patient, please look into their diet and habits and the BMI and obesity and whatever. So that is one. And secondly, you mentioned about Taiwan and that is what I was trying to get to. I think it is important for us to get back to our roots. Not necessarily you have to eat olive. You know, people have grown up, you know, at least 20, 30 years ago. We used to have fantastic food products. Our soppugalu, there used to be about 40 different types. Chilukure, Dantu, Sabakshi, Huli Sopu, Kashi Sopu. And if you actually look at it, there is so much just with us. India is so rich and diverse in what <coughs> we have. I think it is probably one of the best in the whole world. We don't utilize it. You know, I mean, I have grown up in poverty. You know, I have grown up from difficult days and I can afford, you know, a, a, a big meal, every meal today, but, you know, which is not good, which, which, which I, I can't or I shouldn't. So I think simplicity is the answer here. I think, you know, a mudde kaal huli I think that is the simplicity. We used to have, you know, for example, I'm a meat eater. Those days, once in a 15 days was our meat eating. But now, every day we have access to meat. So I think what we have put ourselves to is, I think there is an over provision of everything and scarcity is actually nil. And India is not poor. India is an affluent country. You look at people when they eat food in a canteen, you cannot see a plate which is not got leftovers. I think the whole culture has to change. The whole thought process has to change. We have to get back to our mother nature, get back to the roots and containment and content is the answer, I think. But I think they were excellent questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I think there are two other questions, sir. One is uh, somebody has asked to you to again talk about the disadvantage of using Western toilets. Okay. <laughs> See, this is my bread and butter. Okay. So I have a clinic. Um, the reason I became a colorectal surgeon is um, I thought there's a lot out here which has not been explored. And uh, in simple terms, jovially, we say, uh, where's the money? Money's in the shit. Okay, so this is the, what we say in, in, in our terms. Uh, why Western toilets are bad? Or the Indian way of toileting. We sit, we squat, there is abdominal pressure, there is pelvic floor relaxation, there is puborectal relaxation. Exactly what Ayurveda talks about, malasana. The asana which is used, which is which aids evacuation, malasana. And that is how the mother nature made us. Because there is a muscle called as puborectalis. It is like a sling. It is like a rein of a horse. It is tight. The horse can't move. Similarly, this muscle is tight. The angle between the rectum and the anal canal is not straight. So evacuation cannot happen. So in the Western system of toilets, what happens, the position you sit keeps the rectum and the anal canal at 90 degrees or 95 degrees, and you're pushing from the top to evacuate, but you can't because you're pushing against a closed door. As a consequence, one, the stool is sitting for long hours, two, you get hemorrhoids, fissures, fistulae, cancers, whatever. So when you sit in an Indian toilet, automatically this muzzle relaxes, and the bowel and the anal canal becomes a straight line. Your evacuation is much easier. So why do people get cancers? When there is food wastage, what does it contain? Nitrate, ammonia, phosphate. From the food we have eaten, from the high protein we have taken, from the fertilizers that has been used for the food manufacturing, the preservatives that are put in, the additives that are put in, the flavors that are put in. So imagine a poisonous substance sitting there for long hours, it just irritates the bowel wall, irritates for years together, causes cancers, and also causes abdominal discomfort, bloating, difficulty going to the toilet, leakage, loose tools. All of this are a consequence of the Western toilet. And I think that is the reason Western toilets are not recommended. If you are using a Western toilet, you ask them to put a stool to the foot to raise the level of the knees, 
and we call that as a squatty potty or we tell them, in fact, what do we teach? I run a pelvic floor clinic every week. It's busy. We get people and we teach them malasana. So that is the reason I said, where is the money? Money is in the shit. You tell them how to shit. You teach them how to shit. You know, sort of thing. So I think we have to get back to our roots, get back to our traditions. And uh, truly, I think, you know, the westernization has ruined us. Uh, we have to get away from it. We are talking about, you know, going back to Indian toilets. You know, sorry, the westerners are talking about going back to Indian toilets and, you know, Harvard puts research, Stanford puts research, and then we Indians are trying to go to the Western toilet. So uh, this, is the, this is the paradox, so to say. Uh, so that leaves me with one more question you asked about the irritable bowel syndrome. Yes. It is all multifactorial, as I said. If you think about irritable bowel syndrome, it is a diagnosis of exclusion. It is not a diagnosis of inclusion. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. Andre, they should have had colonoscopy, normal. They should have had biopsies, normal. They should not have any organic problem, normal. But what IVS could be related as, could be related to one bacterial dysbiosis. There are bacteria which produce a lot of gas. And this is what is giving them bloating, spasm, pain, and blasty diarrhea. Or it could be the other way, constipation. This could be due to lack of probiotics. This could be about lack of, you know, enough non-gas producing organisms. And also food plays a role. There is something called as a FODMAP diet. So you have to avoid FODMAP diet. What is FODMAP? Fermentable, oligo, di, mono, amino, polysaccharides. So things like simple sugars, honey, papaya, rice, potato, that can give you quick energy. You know, you say, I'm very hungry. Let me eat some food. It is not chapati, it is not roti, it is not, it is something quick burst of energy that gives you chocolates. So all of these simple carbs, when they go into the stomach, bacteria act on them, that release sudden burst of energy, energy, carbon dioxide, water, and that sudden gush of gas that is released leads on to bloating, spasmodic pain, diarrhea. So this is what causes irritable bowel. So when people come to our clinic, we look at organic problems, none. Functional problems, we evaluate. Then we look at bacterial dysbiosis. Then we also look at the food diet they're on, put them on FODMAP diets. We try and regulate their bacterial load by giving Econom, which is a capsule with you know Saccharomyces and other medications. And also we treat them with psychotherapy, calming methods and you know positive thinking and meditation and so on and so forth. So I think these are all the things we adapt in our clinics when the people come with IBS. Thank you, sir. Maybe we have time for one or two questions more. Uh, one is, has fecal transplant in humans proven to improve any disease condition? Yeah, it is surely it is surely up to a level of 100% effective in colitis. Colitis is uh, C. diff colitis, IBD colitis, ulcerative colitis, uh, Crohn's colitis. So this is all tried and tested. The work is ongoing and fecal transplant is uh, utilized you know, enormously in centers of expertise. But the adaptation of fecal transplants has not come much to India because of the acceptance. People say, ah, how can I have the fecal transplant? But when it is packaged in a capsule, they're happy to take. <laughs> yes. We do fecal transplants and fecal transplants are very popular for autism in the United States, very popular, really? very expensive affair in the United States because the regulations are far too many, the tests have to go, but people fly from all over the world for fecal transplants. And that is the reason we are doing fecal transplants here in Bangalore. Uh, you know, I do fecal transplants uh, because it's proven to a great extent in autism, you know, autism. And, uh, you know, uh, less work has, and even in cancer, there's a lot of work that has been done. Uh, but not so much so that, you know, we are giving them, you uh, know, fecal transplants to prevent cancers. They are creating a biobank and a stool bank here locally in Bangalore. Uh, people are working in IIIT. Uh, They're creating a stool bank and I'm working with them for setting up a stool bank. So we also have Dr. Gokula Krishnan with us, who is a young uh, faculty in the Department of Neurochemistry. Uh, he is uh, one of the few people in Imans who work on the gut microbiome. So Dr. you have any comments or questions? You are muted, man. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, yeah, yeah. I can, sir. I can. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is really a uh, wonderful lecture, and uh, thank you for your time, sir. 
So my question regarding you're talking about the, the fecal biobank. Okay, so uh, I was hearing about the germ-free fecal uh, transplantation. So how will you purify this uh, fecal content and then before going to the transplantation? Sure. So the ways that it is done are very sir. In India, we don't actually purify them. We just filter them. We just uh -huh. filter them. And our selection criteria is not uh, very strict. So we pick it up from healthy family members. Okay. So, uh, but in the West, we run through all, even here we run through uh, serological tests to exclude hepatitis, HIV, all those things. In the West, not only they exclude all the uh, important, you know, viral illnesses, but they also sterilize it to an extent where they're uh, purifying and having only the needed required bacteria. But that takes a lot more effort and time and money because they segregate and pick up the uh, species of bacteria needed. And then they also culture them to grow them and then transplant it. But in India, because of one, lack of regulations, two, there is not much of ethical governance issues here. And three, if I if we go in the Western way, they'll have to spend almost three to four lakhs per fecal transplant, which people wouldn't be happy with. Uh, the crude way of doing, you know, fecal transplants is pick it up, filtrate, and just put the filtrate, not the solid stool. Because here we are looking, fecal oral transam contaminations are quite common. You know, in a home, in a family, you know, come on, how much of fecal oral contamination happens? So here it is less regulated, but we just use the filtrate from the stools you know, uh, to be given at the right temperature. We go in with a colonoscope, spray it to the terminal ileum and come out. We are working on whether we can create capsules, but I think that's some time away to come. Okay, in this context, my focus, long-term focus is uh, developing a new psychobiotics. Okay, so uh, whether I can pick up the specific strain which are beneficial to any disease model and we can give it as a, a psychobiotic 100% you can, and that is what IIIT is doing. In fact, I'm working them and they've got reasonable academic profile. I've uh, been working with them to create these, you know, disease specific biomes. You know, whether we can recommend, say, four of these bacteria for cancer, five of these bacteria for autism, six of these bacteria for IBS. So this is what is in the pipeline. Maybe that's, that's what is seen maybe in about a decade or two. Okay. Okay, but how it is influenced uh, with the changes uh, with regulated gut microbiome or gut metabolites? Both. I, th I, think, I think you can't ignore because one leads to the other, you know. So okay. the gut microbiome and the microbiota, you know, they, they go mm -hmm. hand in hand. So it has to be evidence-based. For example, we can do what we are doing. See, giving microbiota or giving fecal transplant for irritable bowel. Evidence is weak but we give it because there is anecdotal evidence that it helps, but you cannot get an FDA approval. You cannot get regulatory approvals in the West, yeah. but in India, I, I don't think it matters. It's a trial you mm -hmm. give, you know, you spend about eight to 10,000 and, you know, and majority of the times it does help. No, think about it this way, you know, so you, 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 you know, our manure, what we use, for example, you know, I come from a village background. So I always take you back to the, 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 the place where I come from. The manure has got a lot of, you know, there are worms, which are, you know, uh, earthworms, you know, different types of worms. So what do you do? You take a few of them, spray it around in the farm. Yeah. Because they multiply. They are good bacteria. You know, so I think this is what we are trying to do. We are just taking something, spraying them in the gut so that the good bacteria can multiply. But can I just pick this type of worm and not the others? We are not doing that. I think the West is trying to do that, but I think it's still a long time before we go. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you Gokul. Thank you, sir. Uh, so Dr. Narsimhaya, how much time do you have? Do you have five minutes? Can I finish up the last two questions or it is yeah, getting please, late for no, you? No, no, please, sir. go ahead, go ahead. Okay. So there are two questions. One is, uh, are there clinical outcome measures to assess gut dysbiosis? And the second question is the use of laxatives on their influence on the gut microbiome. Yes, sir. So Imperial College London has done a fair bit of work on gut microbiome and microbiota. So the answer for your question, question is yes and there are uh, banks and in fact data is being captured uh, as a part of data mining on the fecal microbiome project which looks at different you know uh, uh, microbiota you know sort of 
bacteria organisms the genomes that come with it and the diseases that can be associated with it that's a bigger project on the imperial college london which they're working on uh, coming to the second question of laxatives uh, anything that can wash things very uh, rapidly rampantly can do that for example when people have bowel prep for colonoscopies they have a lot of diarrhea it is like you know washing your farm with fast rapid spreading water so you wash away all the nutrients associated with it so it is like you know fields on the farm which are on the hill when rain comes everything gets washed away similarly this bacteria can get washed away and that is what happens in things like antibiotic associated diarrheas or excessive purgative usage or laxative usage or even for that matter viral gastroenteritis so whenever these things happen people land up with what we call as post viral enteropathy so the answer for your question is in moderation it's okay in excess yes it can have a significant impact right and uh, there are questions on uh, prebiotics i'll combine the two questions so the primary thing is if you take prebiotics and probiotics do the changes sustain or you have to keep taking them for a very long period of time no sir see what is happening is it is about seeding okay you put the seeds in and if the environment is right it will pick it up there is no need for it to be continuously taken the commercial companies will have an interest the only probiotic that has been authorized for use is something called as a vsl3 that is because of a trial that ran in ucl college london long time ago but as i said amman manaliro huli is much better than a probiotic on the shelf <laughs> yes sir. yes yes so i think uh, you have been uh, quite wonderful sir I, we used to be told by our uh, elders that dina kumma tindavanu yogi eradu tindavanu bhogi murne tindavanu rogi bhogi naal tindavanu ekkond hogi absolutely right we, sir absolutely right i think we should uh, go back to that and uh, we yeah. would uh, want to keep in touch with you sir dr gokul yeah. krishnan may be interested to do uh, some work uh, with the iit that you said because sure. in our uh, department uh, you know chemistry he has some previous experience of gut microbiome and he has two three students working on that now so we'll try and keep in touch with you sir very nice to have you and uh, you know uh, i think uh, uh, kishor and you may and me all may be contemporaries in terms of our uh, mbbs uh, because uh, you said you were an npg junior resident in nimans is that right? 1999 2000 i was right. at mohan, mohan k isaac uh, oh, john so john p john was my senior resident right uh, and me and john p john used to have a wonderful time in the hostels those days that was uh, immediately after your mbbs is it sir correct when i was prepared i thought i'll prepare for my exams but i hardly got any time to study okay. mm -hmm. so <laughs> then in that sense i think you must be my mbbs contemporary because i finished my mbbs in 99 and i joined nimans in 2000 right right maybe at that time mahesh was there from spandana he was oh yes yes, yes 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 okay uh, he was in rpg yeah. vijay vijay from child, child psychiatry is uh, was my senior resident right, so, right. Yeah, a lot of them sagnik who is in uh, mortsley okay. yes. is my contemporary so sort of thing you know so oh very good sir dr venkat i think also was there maybe correct, you know correct him. correct, correct. So, yeah john of course they are all my colleagues now right. so very wonderful sir thank you very much we'll keep in touch with you right and sir. let's see if we can do some work together no oh, absolutely sir no i'm ever grateful to you all and i'm really grateful to kishore kishore happens to be my high high school classmate so ah, right. in fact okay. uh, we have shared you know the initial days of our schooling our journey together so right. you know, so i'm very grateful to him and i'm very grateful to one and all i certainly will stay in touch and there is certainly scope for working together sir. yes sir yes sir yes, thank sir. you very much thank you thank you sir is it possible to take a group photo with everybody in uh shiram sir he left just a moment sir i'll call him because it'll be nice to have a group photo with everybody in uh okay pick it up tomorrow i'll give it tomorrow i'm busy today okay. just a moment i'll call him yeah yes thank you bye just sir he wants to take a group photo can you join
Pavan Ochara. Okay, I'm coming. Two minutes, I'm coming. Two minutes. Yes, I think he has joined. Ah, sir has joined. You can see me, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, yeah. You take a group photo from memory and share it across. Sir. Sure, sure, sure. Sure, sure. sure. Who's taking it, sir? I think uh, screenshot uh, they're taken already. Yes, she's taking it. Aditi is taking it. Yeah, yes. So nice to see you, sir. We'll hope to see you in physical form once this call. Sir, physical so, form, and um, I would like to invite you all to a farm of mine on Nandi Hills called as Nandi Nisargadham. So, oh, oh. it's a very beautiful farm. So I'll be delighted to have you all there. Our department will organize a. I think it'll be good. I think it'll be good. <laughs> and, uh, yes, it's nice so Kishore, farm. you are in charge of that. I think Kishore, we should make him in charge. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, sir. Sir, if the photo is done, I'll take your permission and leave. Uh, Thank you, sir. First, all of you, please uh, turn on the video, please. Who else is not turned on? Some people have joined newly again, sir. Whoever have oh, left. Yeah. Oh. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I think most of them turned their videos on. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Aditi. Yes, sir. Done, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nasimaya.